Nuclear Steve, hot seat. Eight, six, what six. are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halady. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we're happy to present an extended interview with Dr. Christopher Busby, a British scientist who has been so effective in fighting the nuclear industry that he's become a favorite target of nuclear takedown artists and smear campaigns. Hear why the pro-nukers fear him so much as he shares insights, history, science, and strategies. Plus, listener favorite numbnuts of the week, activist shoutouts, my weekly kvetch to John Stewart, and more nuclear information than is known by the entirety of the U.S. Congress, which isn't that hard to do. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, December 2nd, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Starting with a roundup of nuke reactor news in the U.S. with with the happy news that the Vermont Yankee nuclear plant in Vernon, Vermont, will be going bye-bye at the end of December of this year. Louisiana-based Entergy had planned to shut it down late in 2015, so this comes as an early present to us all. Congratulations to the shut-it-downers for their extremely creative and persistent work, including many arrests, and Happy New Year to all. In Illinois, Exelon Corporation is considering shutting down three of its nuclear facilities in that state, Quad Cities, Byron, and Clinton. Citing economic concerns, the company said that it will not make a final decision on the closings until after next June, giving state lawmakers time to be bought off, uh, study the market, and find solutions. Richard Myers, a senior VP at the Nuclear Energy Institute, said that they want lawmakers to create a model to regulate a fair and equitable marketplace. And it seems the marketplace is saying, dump nukes, go green. A group of citizens living near the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant in Lacey Township, New Jersey, has joined a national radiation monitoring network and recorded spikes in radiological releases on two separate occasions, during an unplanned hot shutdown in July and after the plant went back online during an annual refueling in October. As we know from the interview with Dr. Ian Fairley on nuclear hot seat number 165, radiation always spikes during refueling when fuel rods are removed from the reactor core. The Lacey citizens are putting pressure on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to establish independent monitoring of radiological releases from nuclear power facilities, saying this information should be released in real time and easily accessible to the public. Hear, hear. Florida Light and Power is dealing with a passel of problems. One of two reactors at South Florida's ailing and failing Turkey Point Nuclear Power Station, only 41 miles south of Miami, was taken offline on Sunday, November 30th due to a steam leak. The reactor is a nuclear antique, so primitively designed that it uses a 168-mile network of open-air canals to cool its ancient reactors, which were built in 1972. And on January 9th of this year, Florida Power and Light's St. Lucie Nuclear Power Plant, which is only 55 miles north of West Palm Beach, was hit with a freak rainstorm and 50,000 gallons of water flooded the plant's number one reactor building. Had the reactor tripped during the storm, all of the emergency core cooling pumps would have been submerged. Under that scenario, according to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, 
After 24 hours, the plant would not achieve a safe and stable condition and reactor core would be damaged unless emergency recovery action succeeded. As a result, the NRC notified Florida Power and Light on November 19 that it would be subject to increased safety inspections because of the violations. Oh, slap me on the wrist. It feels so good. St. Lucie could have gone Fukushima, and all the NRC is doing is saying, we're going to watch you more closely, young lady. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Nuke and Frack, the crap shit brothers, are trading pollutants back and forth like penny stocks. North Dakota recently discovered piles of garbage bags containing radioactive waste dumped by oil drillers in abandoned buildings. Now the state is trying to catch up with this naughty, naughty oil industry that produces an estimated 27 tons of radioactive debris from wells every day. Existing fines have apparently not been enough to deter contractors from dumping radioactive oil filters, note to North Dakota, make the fines bigger, and the state is in the process of drafting rules that require oil companies to properly store the waste in leak-proof containers. Yeah, like that worked really well for Los Alamos at the WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, where one container went boom and created not only a 1,600-degree fire, but the probable permanent closure of the country's only underground repository for nuclear waste. Meanwhile, up in Saskatchewan in northern Canada, the government and the nuclear industry plan to build a small, cute, teensy-weensy, isn't it adorable, nuclear reactor to power extraction of oil from the Alberta tar sands. In other words, to power fracking. Two of the world's worst polluting technologies in unholy alliance with each other, having their own little closed party of a fuel cycle. And that's why, nukes and fracks, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. A truly upsetting story out of the three counties that surround the Hanford site in southeastern Washington. The rates of anencephaly, which is a neural tube disorder that always proves fatal to infants, has reached as high as 20.8 cases per 10,000 births in Yakima County. This is 2,860% of the U.S. national rate. So-called health experts insist that Hanford, which had eight plutonium production reactors dumping a daily average of 50,000 curies of radioactive material into the Columbia during World War II, had nothing to do with it. Yeah, right. Keeping on the health impact theme, in Japan, tachyrrhythmia cases which are abnormal heart rhythms, have increased approximately eight times as much as in 2010 at Sendai Kusei Hospital. In 2010, the hospital had only 211 medical treatments, the 34th most results in Japan. In 2011, it reached 581, and as of 2012, the most recent year, there were 1,637 cases, the largest number in Japan. Officials, of course, say that this has nothing to do with radiation from Fukushima. A facility to incinerate radioactive debris and other waste is ready to open in Kawauchi, Fukushima Prefecture. This was previously reported on by Beverly Finlay Kaneko in Nuclear Hot Seat Number 178 as part of Voices from Japan. The facility is designed to burn seven tons of waste per day, quote, while removing radioactive cesium, end quote removing it by putting it into the air as smoke and ash. Ministry officials plan to put the facility into full operation in early January. In Tokyo, Keith Baverstock, former head of the Radiation Protection Program at the World Health Organization's Regional Office for Europe, has slammed the United Nations UNSCIR report on Fukushima radiation as not qualified to be called scientific. This report said basically that Fukushima radiation was no big deal and would result in no cancer cases. 
Beverstock pointed out that members of UNSCEAR are nominated by nations that have a vested interest in nuclear power, that such nations provide funds to the committee, and no one needs to declare their ties to the nuclear industry in order to serve. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first, Nuclear Hot Seat needs your help. There are monthly expenses connected with this show, and it's often a challenge for me to meet them. I don't want to have to cut back or, heaven forbid, suspend production. So your support will help me continue to help you understand the nuclear issue with as much humor, sass, and accuracy as I can manage. So if Nuclear Hot Seat makes you think, laugh, gives you a feeling that you're part of a community of activists fighting nukes around the world, which you are, help us keep doing it. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com. Scroll down on the home page and click on the red donate button or on the linked wording next to it to get to the PayPal site. Whatever you can do to help, it is greatly appreciated. This week for the interview, we feature Dr. Chris Busby. He of the YouTube videos, jaunty berets, and deceptively shambling manner, who has been a brilliant, reliable source on nuclear dangers since long before Fukushima began, As you'll hear in the interview, he is a scientist, activist, and has a long history of going up against the nuclear goliaths and daviding them down to size. Dr. Busby is the Scientific Secretary of the European Committee on Radiation Risk and for a long time was the spokesman on science and technology for the Green Party of England and Wales. We spoke last week via Skype. Dr. Christopher Busby, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Yes, hello, uh, Libby, hello. First of all, for those people who perhaps aren't fully familiar with you and your work, give us a sense of your training and background. I got a first degree in in chemistry from the University of London, and then I worked at the Wellcome Research Laboratories in Beckenham on the physical chemistry of molecular interactions at the cell level, aimed at looking at how drugs work, really. And this is something I'm still interested in, in fact. Uh, And then I did a PhD at Queen Mary College London on this sort of issue, um, spectroscopic methods for investigating molecular interactions at the cell level. But I I didn't like it very much, you know, it wasn't going anywhere. So I went back to Wellcome and I worked there for a while and then I just got fed up with the whole business and I then went away and sailed off in my boat for a bit. Then I went back and did another PhD, which I finished uh, at the University of Kent on similar sort of things, the spectroscopy it is really, because this is how we know what's going on right down at the the teeny weeny level. You can actually see these things in terms of their interactions by using various forms of light and electromagnetic energy. So it's real, you know, it's not speculative. You can actually figure out what's going on. So then I worked for a while as a postdoc on fuel cells. And then I, I went back to the boat moved to Wales and then the Chernobyl rainfall fell on my head and I decided that I ought to start investigating the health effects of radiation. That was in about 1987, 88. Everyone was saying, oh, well, it's perfectly safe, you know, the, this rainfall can't hurt anybody because the dose is too low. And at the same time, we had the Sellafield inquiry into, it, it, there was a court case there about children who had leukemia around Sellafield and they were saying, oh, well, it couldn't be a problem because the dose is too low and so forth. So I decided to take it on. And at that time, it was just because I, I'm very interested in all sorts of things. And at that time, it was just one of those things I was interested in. But then it sort of sucked me in like a kind of quagmire and I sort of like walked into the swamp and I've never really been able to emerge. <laughs> And we're much better informed because of it. What were you discovering and how did you formulate it in the time after Chernobyl when you started doing this research? Well, I'm an empiricist, you know. I believe in data. I'm not really with these people who speculate too much. I I think you have to base everything that you do on numbers and on data. And so I looked after Chernobyl at, at the data and saw the sorts of things that were happening, the, the, the stuff that was coming out of Chernobyl and so forth. And I had already got interested in this area of internal radiation and health because I was concerned about being blown up by some atomic war. And that's partly why I took my family to Wales, because it was it was far away from anything. We were in the mountains. We thought if there was a nuclear war and we were going to survive, that would be one place where it would be most likely we could. So I knew a bit about it. 
So that was around about the time my, my oldest daughter was off to Cambridge, so she could get me all the scientific papers and so on. So although I was sitting up a mountain, I had quite good access to information. And I quickly realized that the whole basis of the risk model that was used was a, was a sort of very, very simplistic physics-based understanding, as if people were pieces of wire that you could load up with weights and stretch. And it was clearly nonsense, you know, from my biophysical background at, at, at Wellcome and working with real molecular level understanding of how cells interact with their environment, it was clearly nonsense that, that you couldn't take a physics view of living systems. It, living systems operate on extraordinarily complicated and sophisticated levels. And they have all sorts of defense mechanisms which can be overwhelmed, which means that the dose response to any sort of stress, not just radiation stress, is, is extremely complicated. And, and uh, you have to look at it empirically. You have to look at how it works in terms of real-world studies of phenomena of populations, if you like, that are exposed to, in this case, radiation. And so where I came in was to look at two populations, um, which were the population of whales, which is a very rainy country, small little rainy country where I lived, where there was a lot of fallout from the atmospheric nuclear weapons testing in the 60s. And I compared that with England, which is much drier because it's in the rain shadow of the mountains of Wales and has far lower levels of fallout. And, and one thing about the English is that they're very good at measuring things. So there was an enormous amount of data showing how much radioactivity had fallen, how much strontium-90 there was in Wales, how much in England, how much plutonium in Wales, how much in England, and so forth. So you had two quite similar populations genetically that you could compare in terms of their cancer levels, because also in England there, there were very good cancer registry figures for cancer incidents in these two places. Um, I discovered by comparing these two populations that the result of being exposed to quite what would be called not very high levels of strontium-90, you know, in total probably about a one millisievert of internal strontium-90, caused a 30 to 40 percent increase in cancer in Wales relative to England. And so that was the first piece of data that I had that enabled me to start on my exploration of how it was that this was happening at the cellular level. So from having done the epidemiological backup to all this, I then took it back to the cell level to see if I could figure out how it was that they had made this mistake. Of course, I realized eventually that, they, that it wasn't a mistake at all. It was just a cover-up, and, and very likely they knew exactly what you were going to say, they, that the people who, uh, the military mainly, I guess, but certainly the nuclear industry were perfectly aware of the fact that these internal radionuclide exposures were not properly modelled using this external risk model that they developed after Hiroshima. What did you do with this data? Did you start publishing it? And if so, when and what was the response? Yes, the first thing that I discovered was that there was a big increase in bone cancer in Wales. And now bone cancer is a flag for exposure to strontium-90. So I published a, a little letter in the British Medical Journal, um, which in those days you had to have it peer-reviewed before they took a letter from you. And also I published a small book booklet in Welsh and English, which I printed myself, because I, I, I didn't have any money. I mean, my, I've never really been funded much, and in those days I wasn't funded at all. So what I did was I rebuilt a printing press, <laughs> and I printed this book myself. Uh, and then I, I distributed it through various Green Party anti-nuclear people, and that's what started it all. So that, that was called Radiation and Cancer in Wales. That basically presented what I've just told you about this differential level of cancer that followed after the nuclear testing. Uh, and at the same time, I joined the Green Party, and I became a sort of Green Party person, and we did various non-violent direct actions against local nuclear power stations. I chained myself up to the power station and called in the media and so forth. So... I raised the level of interest in all of this quite powerfully by doing these actions, and that led to the local community um, representatives, the councillors and so on, forcing the Wales Cancer Registry to release data that enabled me to do more studies of the increases in cancer in Wales. That, that enabled me to look in smaller areas of Wales, so you could look closer to the nuclear power station or closer to the coast or closer to Sellafield or, or wherever. So in order to get more resolution in the studies that I was doing, uh, the epidemiological studies I was doing, then I'd run out of money by then. So I went to the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust, cap in hand, the Quakers, and I said, look here, you know, there's this little book I've got, but I mean, I've got an awful lot now that I've studied that, that I found out about this situation, and it's really 
it's really outrageous. People are dying, and you know, there's this cover up about the health effects of internal radionuclides, which is a major, major public health scandal. It has to do with the genetic integrity of the human race and, and, and all these big things, which were all true. And they said, okay, sure, we'll, we'll give you a couple of years' money to write a book about this. So I did, and I wrote the first book that I produced, which is, I think, probably the best one, called uh, Wings of Death, which I published in 1995, thanks to the Round Trees. And we published it ourselves. So in other words, we set up a publishing company and we had it printed and we, and we sold it ourselves. And the reason for that is because it contained a lot of stuff that I think normal publishing companies, Hodder and whatever, you know, would have gone to their lawyers and said, well, you know, is this okay? And the lawyers would have said, no, somebody will sue you. In fact, in the end, nobody did sue us, but that's why we decided to go down that route. So that was the first book, Wings of Death. And then after that, the Roundtrees continued to support me, and I was also supported by Sir James Goldsmith, the millionaire, on a quite modest level, you know, not a big deal, and he bought me a printing press. So that was when I started printing Radioactive Times, and, and we set up the low-level radiation campaign. That was in the early 90s. So that's how it all started. What was the response that you were getting to the materials you were putting out, and especially what kind of official resistance, if any, was there as you came forward with the information? Well, it was sort of like Gandhi says, you know, first they laugh at you, then they attack you. And, of course, he also said, then you win, but this hasn't happened so far. Because, of course, you have to realize that, well, you know well, quite well that I've taken on an enormous monolithic operation, the, the, the nuclear military complex. It's not exactly a small outfit. So what they did was they quite quickly took me seriously because the stuff that I was putting out was not simplistic stuff. See, the problem is in those days, and to some extent even so now, the anti-nuclear movement consists mainly of people who are not scientifically literate. I mean, they're very clever people. They have all sorts of degrees and PhDs in sociology and anthropology and various humanities. But when it comes down to doing the sort of heavy-duty number crunching and statistics and all that stuff, none of them can really do it, you know. And, and that's why quite early on I set up an operation called Green Audit with a colleague. Um, the idea of this was to bring some kind of scientific searchlight that we could bring to bear on uh, publications that were in the peer review literature or even just self-published by the nuclear industry and by their cronies. Because a lot of the stuff that they published, although they get it published, because, of course, they put it past their own referees, is very, very poor quality and, and, and quite often is dishonest. So we were able to do that. And, and I think quite quickly the, the radiological protection boards and people like that, the government agencies, they saw that we were quite a threat to them. And so they took us seriously and they produced reports about how everything we said was wrong and, you know, we'd made this mistake and that mistake and so on. So I've been battling those people from very, very early on, on the scientific level. So they certainly didn't ignore us. And we quite quickly picked up quite a few allies in the government too. For instance, towards the end of the 90s, we uh, did some studies in Wales for the Irish government which led to uh, another book that I wrote. In, but it was in, in, re in relation to a court case. We were looking at cancer along the coast of Ireland and Wales relative to the concentrations of radionuclides in the Irish Sea uh, as a result of releases from the reprocessing plant at Sellafield. And what we found was that there was an effect, which I called the sea coast effect, where there was a, a strip of about one kilometre along the coast where radionuclide contamination, which had become attached to sediment, was being resuspended by wave action and blown inland, and people were inhaling it and, and getting significantly high levels of cancer. Um, this was possible because as a result of those two first books that I produced, I had a lot of exposure on the television and a lot of exposure led to interviews with county councillors and MPs who, who put pressure on the Wales Cancer Registry to release data. And in the end, they did release the data, so that enabled us to do that big study. Uh, and by the end of that, we had friends in high places. We had a lot of MP members of Parliament friends, and, and I even got very close to Michael Meacher, who was then the Environment Minister under Tony Blair. And the other thing we did was we stopped the transposition of the, the URATOM, the 1996 URATOM Basic Safety Standards Directive, which at that time allowed people to dilute nuclear waste into consumer goods. 
<laughs> I know, I know. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? But I, we did a lot of television programs on that, and we got this stuff out. And, and, and see, if we hadn't done it, nobody would have, because nobody knew this was happening. It was some arcane law that was passed in the European Parliament, you know, in the European Commission. And uh, if the European Greens hadn't brought that to my attention, and a few other people like Rosalie Bertel and Alice Stewart, who was still around then. And the three of us went off to Brussels and found out about all of this stuff. And then we gave them a bad time and we set up a new organization. Because I see all this stuff politically. I have a kind of political view of it all. I, I mean, as a result of my Green Party operations and so forth, I don't see this as primarily as arguments about science. The science is straightforward. And there's enough science out there. We've sort of won the scientific argument. The problem is, then what? It's like philosophers have uh, interpreted the world. The point is to change it. And so we thought that rather than fighting these people head on, because as I said, you know, we were having, being attacked by the National Radiological Protection Board and by the French nuclear industry and, and all these people were having a go. In fact, I had a dream. I'll tell you about this dream. It, this is what started it all off. I had this dream in which there was this high wire fence and there was a gate in the fence and, and all the clever people were trying to pick the lock on the gate in the fence to go through because it was, it was, we had to get through because there was freedom on the other side or whatever. I don't know. You know what dreams are like. Uh, and then I sort of stood back at it all and I looked to see and actually there was, the, it was just a fence in a field and you could just walk around it. <laughs> you know, so I thought about this. So I woke up and I thought, and I thought, well, look, you know, instead of trying to fight these people all the time, we should just make our own institute. You know, so that's what I did. I talked to Alice and, and Rosalie Bertel and a few other people, Alexei Yablokov and so forth. A lot of those Soviet people, um, ex-Soviet. And, and they said, yeah, sure. So we set up the European Committee on Radiation Risk uh, under the sort of umbrella of the Greens in, in the European Parliament. And we thought, well, we won't bother with their risk model and fighting it and trying to tamper with it and argue with it and all this stuff, which is enormously painful and boring and tedious and goes on forever and you never win it. Because they've got the power, of course, you see. I mean, it's like trying to stand in front of a steamroller. It's much cleverer just to walk around the steamroller and build, build your own steamroller and then just go on the other way, you see. So that's what we did. And it was absolutely fantastically successful. It was extraordinarily successful. Tell us about one of these successes. The success in terms of the European Committee on Radiation Risk thing is that it was immediately of interest to all the people who were concerned about radiation. And it also enabled me to do an awful lot of court cases and win them. So around about 2000 or so, I started to get interest in, in this European Committee on Radiation Risk Risk Model from people who were, from lawyers, mainly in America, who were taking court cases in which people had been contaminated with radionuclides of various types and had, had developed cancer and sometimes had died of cancer and so it was their kin who were taking the case. And of course in the United States it's, it's a big thing, this sort of tort cases. It's not like England. You, you, you know, they make huge amounts of money so they go after some big company and they say, look, this chuck worked for you and he was contaminated with this and that and then he got cancer, you know, and we're going to sue you for $100 million, you see. I mean, that kind of thing happens. So I got picked up by a number of these different attorneys and started to win cases for them using the European ECRR model, which we developed and I edited and finished in 2003. And that's available on the Internet. We made it a free download so anybody can get it. And it's now been translated into Russian and Czechoslovakian and Japanese and Spanish and French. So it's quite a major document. It has a different risk model. It explains how you can calculate how many cancers you're going to get as a consequence of whatever exposure. So you can put in the exposure and, and it drops out the cancers. Just like the conventional model, just like the ICRP model, but it works slightly differently. Um, the difference is it gives the right answer. So first of all, we got a lot of success in the courts. We won lots and lots of cases because if you get this stuff in front of a jury you can persuade them quite quickly that the conventional risk model is complete nonsense and cover-up and, and, you know, people are dying as a result of it. And they say, yeah, OK, and then you win the case, you see. So that was one, one area where we were winning, where it was successful. And, and the other area was where we... very good one is in 2004, this young Swedish scientist, um, doctor, uh, epidemiologist called Martin Tondell, published the results of his PhD thesis, which involves looking at the effects of the contamination from Chernobyl on northern Sweden, 
when Chernobyl accident occurred, a lot of that stuff went north and it precipitated in northern Sweden and Finland and the Baltic states to some extent where I live. And Tondel looked at the small areas of northern Sweden and very simplified what he did is he just correlated the levels of cancer in the small areas with the levels of contamination to cesium. So there's like a straight line. And and what he showed was that there was an 11% increase in cancer in northern Sweden for every 100 kilobecquerels of cesium-137 on the ground. And it was statistically significant and so on. Of course, of course, he was immediately attacked and so forth. But the, the power, powerful thing for us was that when we calculated the ECRR model for the same situation, we got the same answer. And we published that in 2003, you see. So it was like somebody coming along and doing a study which vindicated the analysis that we had previously developed and published. So it's a bit like Einstein and, and Eddington's measurement of the transit of Venus and all those things. So, you know, it, was like, it was like proof that we were on the right track. So that was also quite a success. You have been used as an expert witness now in a number of court cases, and significantly now you're involved with individual UK nuclear test veteran pension cases where individuals are suing for compensation for exposure to radiation while in the military. This has been a journey you've been on since the mid-2000s. Tell us what's been happening on that and where it stands now. Well, for a long time we were winning those, or I was winning those cases. I'm not actually allowed to say I was winning the cases because as an expert witness you're supposed to be neutral. And this has resulted in maybe six, five or six cases won. And then what happened was that the Ministry of Defence got fed up with losing these cases and they put the outstanding 16 cases into one big case so that it could all be heard together. Um, I was commissioned by the solicitors who were representing these people all of them, called Rosenblatt's the solicitors, to make a a large composite report with individual sort of reportlets, if you like, for each one of these guys, because they had different cancers and different diseases and they were in different places and so on. So I did all that. Then, of course, the Ministry of Defence came back with their version of it and then the judge asked me, to Judge Stubbs this was, in the lower tier, this was about 2011 to 2013, asked me to respond and this went back and forth and so forth. And eventually we managed to get some secret data out of the government Judge Stubbs ordered them to release data about the contamination at the test sites. And then as soon as that data came out, Rosenblatt solicitors pulled out suddenly for no, well, no reason that anybody could real under, really understand. And some new solicitors called Hogan Lovells, they came in. The new solicitors who came in, they were hired by the 16 families or the 16 individuals? Well, not really, no. No, they really, no, not really. What happened was that they just said they would take over from Rosenblatt's. In fact, it turned out at the end that most of the veterans, I mean, a couple of them were even dead, ones that had, you know, that had died over this period. They, they'd commissioned me to write reports for them. Dawn Pritchard was one of them. And then she died because, of course, they're all getting old, these people. I mean, it all happened a long time ago. And the MOD is just stretching it out, stretching it out, stretching it out. So what happened, as far as I can make out, is that Hogan Lovells just stepped in and said, hey, wow, well, we're going to take over. And, and I think a lot of these veterans didn't even know who Hogan Lovells were. And they never were told. Anyway, the point about why I'm saying this in this kind of rather whinging way is that towards the end of it, right, just when it came up to the wire, when, when this thing was going to be heard and I was all ready to go into court and blast the MOD in, into touch, they threw me off the case. They said, oh, we, we're not going to ask you to give any evidence. And so all these cases were lost. They were all lost because, of course, the Hogan Lovells came in and they, they used another expert witness who was a, somebody who had worked for the nuclear industry who basically supported the, ice, the, you know, the current risk model. And un, under the current risk model, there's no way that they could have got cancer because the current risk model says that you've got to have a dose of a 1,000 millisieverts or more, you know, a huge, huge dose, a sort of Hiroshima bomb-type dose before you get a 50% chance of getting cancer. And these guys, of course, they didn't get anything like that in terms of doses. They just got contaminated internally with uranium and plutonium particles from the bombs. So they were much more like the people in Iraq and Fallujah who also didn't get a very high dose and also the people living near nuclear sites who also don't get a very big dose. So it's all about this business of dose and whether it can be used for internal radionuclides. Anyway, what happened was they lost this case, but then what we did was we appealed the decision. And over the last year, this appeal has been going on and it's eventually been heard. 
What happened was the Ministry of Defence came in to the appeal. This is now in the High Court, in the Royal Courts of Justice. And there's a big cheese judge there, Sir William Charles is the judge. And so the MOD came in and they said, well, this guy Busby's not an expert. And not only is he not an expert, but he writes articles in The Ecologist and Counterpunch, you know, and, and, and chains himself to nuclear power stations and all this stuff. And somebody like that shouldn't be allowed into the court to act, act for anybody, you know, because he's obviously biased. And to some extent, they're right, I suppose, yeah. But wasn't it the science that biased you to begin with? Well, and- uh, yes, of course, that's what I said. I said all that. It's precisely what I said. I said, look here, to the judge. I said, if you're a scientist and you discover that something awful is happening and people are dying, it's your duty, your public duty, to go out there and try and stop it from happening. This is like the earliest epidemiologist, who John Snow, you know, who took the pump handle off the pump in the place where they were all getting cholera from the water supply. But you can also talk about Linus Pauling and Albert Einstein and Joseph Rotblatt. And there's a huge list of people, Andrei Sakharov, who, who have been, if you like, activists because their science, you know, made them think that what was going on was very wrong and they, would, and they should try and stop it. So I was just one of those people. But anyway, for whatever reason, so he's now made the decision that I can't be an expert witness, which is a bit sad. But on the other hand, he did say that I could be a representative. When you say representative, what does that mean? I mean, effectively the lawyer. Effectively the lawyer, you see. Now, I've done enough court cases as expert witnesses to, to know how lawyers work. And I'm quite quick on my feet, you know, so I can now cross-examine the Ministry of Defence experts and all this stuff, you know, so they're going to wish they hadn't done this. (laughs) This sounds wonderful. If the proceedings are recorded, is there any way to get a recording that we can then share? No, 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 English, no, they don't, in English courts they don't, but what they do is produce transcripts, so we can get transcripts, and ultimately it might be good to write a little play about this and put it on the stage. When is your opportunity to play Perry Mason in the court and cross-examine the Ministry of Defense going to take place? What's the schedule? The schedule we don't know until Monday. That's like this coming Monday is the directions hearing for the schedule. And what's happened is that Hogan Lovells have come in with a presentation which they're asking the judge to not allow any new evidence in. So if they do that, then it will be quite difficult to cross-examine anybody because there won't be anybody coming in that I can cross-examine. This is like a chess game, you know. So they know exactly what's coming up with me wheeling myself in as Perry Mason. And that's the last thing they want. So they're asking the judge to not permit that to happen in a sort of oblique way. But I think he'll say no. I think he'll pass it on, in which case it will happen next year, as long as the Ministry of Defence don't win an appeal to stop it happening, because that's what they'll do. They will appeal against the decision to the Court of Appeal. So this is going to go up and up and up and up till it gets to the Supreme Court. But meantime, you know, I'll have a lot of fun talking to people like you and, and generally pointing out, you know, the absurdity of it all. We had a report a few weeks ago by Sean McGee where he talked about some of the interference that you have been experiencing with your finances. Have there been attempts to harass you or take you off your game? And what has that consisted of? Well, the worst thing that's happened to me was an attack that was orchestrated against me in 2011 by a reporter for the British Guardian newspaper, name of George Monbiot. He wrote a, a scurrilous and gratuitously offensive attack on me in a major newspaper. And then he followed it up with various things on his blog. And he has quite a high profile as a greenie, uh, as, a, as a green person. And a lot of the stuff he does is okay. I don't have a problem with that. And I sort of know George from way back from Green Party days. But he really laid into me. And as a result of that, I think almost certainly all my funding from the various uh, charities, which at that time, you know, it's not huge, but it kept me going, just stopped, (sighs) totally stopped. And everybody sheared off. And in fact, the Green Party, at that time, I was the shadow minister for science and technology of the Green Party the spokesman on, on science and technology, and they distanced themselves from me very quickly too. That's taken me away from a large amount of support that I have in, in terms of financial, well, in terms of money, really. And so I, I've had to sell my house as a consequence of that and move to Latvia, where I sort of live in the woods with my, with my girlfriend. <laughs> Which, no, I don't really mind, you know. I mean, it's okay. But that did happen, and that has had a significant effect on the financial end of things, yeah. And as far as the other thing, the Sean McGee end of things, which is like, you know, people blocking your emails and all that stuff, that's been happening, yes. That happens a lot. In fact, very recently, too, because I've recently 
written some interesting stuff which I discovered with secret documents about the uranium isotope U-234. Tell us what you've discovered. It turns out that when you make enriched uranium, which is the fuel for nuclear weapons and also for nuclear power to a lesser extent, you have to extract it using centrifuges and so forth, um, the, these extraction methods, which take the U-235 out of the natural uranium as mined. But there is another isotope which nobody really talks about or knows about, which is U-234. And that's even lighter because these centrifuge methods rely upon the lightness, the difference in the mass to separate these things. And the U-235 is the one that, that is fissile and explodes. But when they take the U-235 out, they take also out the U-234. So any U-235 that you have, any enriched uranium that you have for a bomb contains U-234 as well, but the amount of U-234 it contains is enormously high in terms of its activity, because U-234 has a shorter half-life than the other uranium isotopes. So I, I figured this out just on first principles, and then I went looking, and what I found was a, a secret document, or a restricted document from 1953, which was a minutes of a meeting with Carl Z. Morgan, who used to be on the ICRP uh, Committee 2 in 1952. He came to England and there was a meeting at the Atomic Energy Research Establishment in Harwell. And the, those minutes, in that meeting, Morgan said that the main hazard from fallout after a nuclear weapon is from U-234. And it was a radiological hazard. I discovered that in the pile of paper from Rosenblatt's, but it then disappeared. And I couldn't get a copy of it, although more recently I've got a copy of it. So I wrote an article about this in The Ecologist. And then that went out this recently, a few weeks ago. And that was picked up by Counterpunch and put out. And since then, I have received another secret document, which says Secret Atomic, from some guy in Australia who had it. And God knows how he got it. And it actually shows, it actually lists the concentrations of the different uranium isotopes that there are in enriched uranium. And it shows that there's an enormous amount of U-234. And it was probably U-234 that caused most of the problems for the nuclear test veterans. But nobody measured it, you see. There are no measurements of it. There's no sign of it anywhere. And mainly in the United States where they have a number of very big studies that have been done on the Marshall Islands, for example, and on nuclear veterans in the United States who, who are suing the government for compensation for cancer and so forth. There's a standard method for calculating their dose, and it doesn't contain any mention of U-234. So this is a serious cover-up. U-234 is a major, major item, and in the United States, the National Academy of Sciences or whoever it is that deals with this should go back to all the calculations that they've made about the exposure of the test veterans and the Marshall Islanders and, and do them all over again on the basis that this U-234 isotope is, is a major hazard. So that's like a scoop, really. That is. But since then, you know, which is where we came in, I've had a lot of my communications relating to this blocked. And I know this is the case because I've asked, I've phoned people up, say, send me something and say on it, put the word radiation, put the word uranium, you know, and see if it gets in. It doesn't. It doesn't get through. So it's the selective blocking of my emails, for sure. It seems to have got a bit better now, but over the last three weeks, it's been really bad. I've had to phone people up in order to make sure that, that they get, then I've had to use other emails and set up different emails and all this nonsense. You were talking about nuclear veterans or veterans in the United States who've dealt with nuclear issues. What, if any, contact have you had with the attorneys who are representing the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan and the other military personnel who were exposed to the radiation plume Fukushima in the first days after the disaster began there in 2011? I haven't had any contact from those people at all, but actually it would be good if they did contact me because I'm pretty sure that their case is, like all the cases that I do, is critically dependent upon arguing in relation to the radiation risk model. You see, because those people in the USS Reagan and, and, and the other people who are suing the government over contamination, they'll get into court and the government agencies will just come straight in there and say the dose wasn't high enough for them to have got their, any cancers or any illnesses at all. So it doesn't matter if they've got cancer. They will say, hey, you know, I was exposed to this radiation. I've got cancer. You've got a duty of care. You know, you have to pay me some money. And the government will say, no, we don't, because the threshold in the United States court, you have to have a 50% probability that the cancer was caused by the exposure. 
And then they'll just go to the ICRP risk model, the conventional model, you know, which is the conventional model in the United States also, National Academy of Sciences model. And they say, well, you know, the, the doses were only this and that and the other. And on that basis, there's no possibility of you getting, having got cancer. Thank you very much. Good night. So the only way you can win that case is by going in there and saying, well, I'm sorry, but for internal radionuclides, here's the evidence that the radiation risk model that you are using is invalid. And there's enough of that. You will have the email and phone number of all those attorneys, and they will have your contact information within one hour of me getting off this call. (laughs) If they want to get in touch with me, I mean, I'm not going to get in touch with them. I've got enough things. But if they want to get in touch with me, I'm quite happy to advise them, you know, just on a sort of two-liner level, that more or less along the lines that I've just told you. Because I've done enough court cases now to know exactly what the issues are. And the main issue is that, that if the dose isn't high enough, you're stuffed. You don't win. And the only way to deal with that is to say, well, you know, d- what does it mean, dose? What does it mean, dose? And, you know, how is it that you can use dose to regulate the consequences of exposure to some isotope that binds to DNA? Since we already know that its DNA is the target for all of these radiation effects. And here you have something that's like a sort of cruise missile that you send into the body and it goes for the DNA. Uranium, it binds to the DNA. Strontium binds to the DNA. And when it goes off pop... That's it. it. It's right on the target. It's not somewhere else in some other cell or in the bone or, or in the cytoplasm, somewhere where it's going to have no effect, whatever. It's right on top of the target. And, of course, the ICRP model doesn't account for that at all. In fact, it was developed before the discovery of DNA, and it's still much the same stupid model that it was originally. What about what is being faced by the people of Japan as a result of Fukushima that we may not have yet been paying attention to? I would like to say a little about the exposure of people to sea to land transfer in Japan because I'm, I'm very concerned about the consequences of Fukushima for people who think it's all over. I've said a lot in various venues and in various articles that I've written about the concentrations of radionuclides from Fukushima in the ocean. And I've more or less said, well, you know, they're probably too low to have much of an effect by the time they get to the United States. But this is not true of people living along the coast of Japan because the releases from Fukushima to the ocean are going to bind to sediments all along the east coast of Japan, right from the north to the south, and certainly down in the very populated coastal areas like Yokohama and so on. And those people think they're a long way away from Fukushima. They think it all happened long ago, and it's not going to have any effect on them. Well, from what we've done in studies of the Irish Sea, and that was the main study I did. But also now I've done some studies of the Baltic Sea, which is also highly contaminated as a result of Chernobyl and also the weapons fallout, because there was the big, huge Tsar bomber, the 40-megaton Soviet bomb, and all that stuff rained down over the Baltic states and Finland and, and Sweden and went into the Baltic. So the studies that we've done around those seas make it quite clear that people who live within one kilometre of the coast are in danger of inhaling radionuclides from sea to land transfer, and they will have a higher risk from cancer. Now, the question is then, so what can they do? Well, I don't know what they can do, but they at least ought to know that that is the situation, and if they want to move away, move inland, whatever. But that's something that needs to be raised, especially if they have children. It's a particularly dangerous issue, and one that's completely overlooked and would certainly not be accepted by the authorities as being real. What's next for you other than getting yourself ready to go into court, should it be allowed? Oh, I'm doing a number of studies. I mean, what I'm doing now is I'm slowly publishing everything that I've done. So, I mean, the the thing is, I've always been accused of not publishing in the peer review literature. And there's some truth in that accusation, because I can tell you it's unbelievably tedious and irritating and frustrating to have to deal with a load of referees for journals whose editors are essentially hostile or frightened. So this area of publication in peer review is dominated by these sorts of psychological problems of of, of frightened editors and hostile reviewers and so forth. But this is getting a lot easier because what's happened in the last few years is the Internet has enabled people to make money out of setting up journals. And so there are a number of journals now where it is easier to get publications in. And so all of the work that I've done since about 1992 is probably about 20 major studies, including studies of breast cancer near nuclear power stations, epidemiological studies of 
of all sorts of populations that show what it is that I'm saying about radionuclide internal exposure is right. All of that stuff, all of my work on uranium and photoelectron enhancement and so forth, which is another new thing, all of that stuff is going to go into the peer review literature. And the one I'm working on at the moment, which is the most entertaining one for me, follows on from Ernest Sternglass' work. And I put it in my first book, Wings of Death. It is the increase in congenital malformations from heart defects amongst children who were born at the peak of the nuclear testing. I've got the data for that from the Registrar General, and it's just a question of doing Poisson regression on it and writing a paper, and it will show that the fallout from the nuclear testing caused a massive, massive increase in deaths from congenital malformations from heart defects, just as it does in Fallujah, and probably for the same reason. Where are your papers going to be published? Is that going to be greenaudit.org? Well, We'll put the links up on Green Audit, but the pu- papers are going to be published in lots of different journals. And the reason for that is as soon as I publish in one journal, the nukes get onto that journal and start attacking it. So then I have to move on to another journal. In the Fallujah paper, they got onto the journal to attack it even before I'd sent the paper to the journal. So they obviously got into my computer and knew the paper and read it and everything, you see. I, mean, I don't really mind this. I, I quite enjoy them doing all this stuff. I don't see any point in trying to stop them doing it. The most important of all of the papers that I've published recently is one that is published as a a book chapter in a a book called New Directions in DNA Repair. It was published by Intech Open, and that was published in 2012, I think. It's, It's up on the Internet, and it's had an enormous number of downloads because basically what it does is it just lays out my whole thesis about the health effects from internal radionuclides in one place. And I think that will make quite a big impact on this area of science. But for those who didn't know about this, that's the one, the Intech Open chapter. And that was blocked for a long time. They were going to publish it in October or November 2012. And then I had a court case in New Orleans in which I was using that chapter as a piece of evidence that this internal radionuclide situation was what it was. And so it got blocked, 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 blocked. But eventually, thank goodness, they published it in 2013. And so that's had a lot lot of effect on people, I think. I think that's going to be the last straw for the nuclear regulators. I hope so, anyway. (laughs) As long as they pay attention to it. Anything you haven't had an opportunity to say that you would like to share at this time? The one message that I give to you and to anyone listening is that the mistake that everybody makes is to talk about low-level radiation because low-level radiation is not harmful. It's not low-level radiation that's the problem. It's internal radiation that's the problem. So, for instance, if you get a low-level radiation from flying an aeroplane to... I don't know, you know, South America or something like that because of cosmic rays, that's not going to harm you because that's equivalently distributed over your whole body and the dose at the DNA is very small. But from internal radiation, which is also low-level radiation, the dose at the DNA is very high. And the reason that the internal radiation is low-level radiation is because they dilute that energy into the whole body, and this is the trick. So it's very important for the lawyers to understand this, and they're doing this case, because if we start saying that low-level radiation is dangerous, we immediately put ourselves in a very easy position to be attacked, to be brought down, and they start talking about bananas and all this nonsense, you know. You have to talk about specific internal radionuclide exposures, and then then you say that the way in which they assess these and make that into low-level radiation is wrong. That's where the error is, and if you take that into court, you win it. I've done it many, many times. Once we get to the jury, we make this simple point that internal radiation is dangerous under circumstances where it's like particles, where you get a big dose in one place, or if it's like something that, like uranium that binds to the DNA, where you get a big dose on the DNA, or a few other situations like that. And they're all in the ECRR book, the ECRR is small. They're all explained, and we put weightings on the dose for those, those situations. Um, then you get the right answer, and you win the court case. But if you start just saying, oh, well, it's low-level radiation, then you're immediately in trouble. You put yourself in a place where it's quite easy to take you down. Dr. Busby, anything that you have that you think is important to bring to attention, please send me an email. We can do a quick interview at any time. 
Okay, good, good. Because okay. I think this is how we're going to win. With people like you, this is how we're going to win. This is not a question of doing this through the scientific or political agency route. It's only through people like you and through the internet and through this sort of approach that, that we're going to defeat these people and save, and save millions. Dr. Chris Busby. His website is greenaudit.org. We will also have a link up to a website that enumerates not only the attacks against Dr. Busby, but dismantles them. That link will be up on nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 180. Activist shout-outs. Thanks to Sean McGee, a.k.a. Sean Arclight on Facebook, for his help in setting up this week's interview with Dr. Busby. Erica Gray of Nears always keeps us up to date on the week's nuclear accidents and the NRC's handling or mishandling of them. Lots of yucks there. And huzzah, huzzah, to Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety, who presented information on dry cask storage and high burn-up fuel to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission because she, a retired corporate executive with no technical background, who also lives within shouting distance of San Onofre, she had discovered that high burn-up fuel, such as was used at Sano, creates problems for long-term dry cask storage that the NRC hadn't a clue about. Don't that make you feel all warm and fuzzy about nuclear? We'll have the embed of Donna's 16-minute presentation to the NRC up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, so that you can see for yourself what a citizen activist can do. John Stewart. Booby, all I want for Hanukkah is a shot at writing nuclear material for your show. So let's do this thing already, okay? And here's today's final thought. It's a memo to the members of the media who listen to Nuclear Hot Seat. And yes, I know you are out there. No matter where you live, no matter what your beat, there is a hot nuclear story just screaming for you to cover it. Environment, energy, medicine, business, eh, those are easy topics. How about sports? How do young amateur athletes feel about putting their health on the line in order to compete in the 2020 Tokyo Olympics? Food news? What about radiation levels in food and the impact and dangers of internal contamination on our health? Even if you deal with traffic issues, What would happen if everyone within, let's say, not a 50, but a 10-mile radius of your local nuclear reactor tried to get out of Dodge in an emergency? Like, you know, an accident at the nuclear reactor. Run it as a computer simulation and write it up and get it out. See, there are plenty of nuclear angles to go around, and plenty of Pulitzers, too. But alas... I've recently learned that Nuclear Hot Seat is not eligible for Pulitzer consideration because it's a podcast. (sighs) But that doesn't mean one of you smart reporters listening out there couldn't take what I'm putting smack in your lap with links posted on the website, no less, so the research is done for you, and turn it into a prize-winning report. Be the first on your block to break the nuclear story wide open. The lives you save may be your own, your family's, and your genetic downlines. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, December 2nd, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, myshamplainvalley.com, qconline.com, grandmothers, mothers, and moms for safe energy, greenmediainfo.com, eenews.net, sfchronicle.com, crisis without end, physicians for social responsibilities, the CDC, Washington anencephaly investigation, tricityherald.com, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, thinkprogress.org, avaz.org, the whip trail, Santa Fe, New Mexican, L.A. Times, Asahi Shimbun, Fukushima Diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, NuclearNews.net, CBSNews.com, and the wildly popular Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. 
Our archive is available on iTunes. You can also subscribe under podcasts. Or just check us out on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. The website still looks a bit funky from our ill-advised update to the theme, but we should be back for what passes as normal soon. Our YouTube channel carries the show courtesy the unflagging support of Joni Ray. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you, yes you, have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Harder Street Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. If you are a not-for-profit group, blog, or website, you have my permission to reuse as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Harder Street Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear Hot Seat